Hello, my name is Larry Kelly, and I'm Vice President for Science Administration at the New York Botanical Garden. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, fifth annual New York City Ecoflora Conference. At any time during the webinar, please submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the window, and we'll save your questions for our speakers to answer later. Live captions can be enabled by clicking the CC button, then show subtitles or view full transcript. Today's presentation is being recorded and it will be available in the NYBG lecture library. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the New York Botanical Garden is located in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. The theme of this year's Ecoflora Conference is celebrating community science in New York City. We'll get to our speakers and their presentations in just a couple of minutes, but first I want to summarize some of the key elements of the New York City Ecoflora and tell you how you can get involved with the project. The New York Botanical Garden created the New York City Ecoflora in 2017 with a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Building on the garden's historical strengths and collections with emerging opportunities in digital technology, the Ecoflora is designed as a community science project to document the wild flora of New York City. To date, more than 30,000 observers have made nearly 860,000 observations of over 11,600 species in New York City observations of plants and fungi and their biotic partners. Each month, we sponsor an EcoQuest challenge, encouraging New Yorkers to observe one or more species and their ecological partners, then upload observations to iNaturalist. We're gonna post a link to the project site in the chat so you can get there. Our current month's EcoQuest challenge is Hidden Harvest. The idea behind this EcoQuest during National Native American Heritage Month is that many familiar plants, such as Kenopodium album and Asimina trilova, are remnant agricultural species that have been cultivated by indigenous societies for thousands of years. While these plants are often mistaken for undesirable weeds, they have rich histories and high potential for use that is unknown to many people. If you would like to sign up to receive information about EcoQuest challenges to your email and other Ecoflora events, we'll put a link for that in the chat where you can do this. The New York Botanical Gardens Ecoflora project has continued since 2017 with renewed support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The goal of the current grant is to scale up and expand the Ecoflora model nationally in partnership with four other public gardens. Today, Ecoflora projects are flourishing at Denver Botanic Gardens, Chicago Botanic Garden, Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, and Marie Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota, Florida. Among our, our collective accomplishments this year are the publication of a toolkit to launch your Ecoflora project and an article in the Journal of the American Public Gardens Association titled Ecofloras, Fostering Community and Biodiversity Discovery. We're putting links to both of these publications in the chat. We're extremely grateful to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for providing funding for community science projects at all five public gardens partners. We're equally grateful to many thousands of community scientists who make original observations of plant and fungi in the Ecoflora projects. Urban biodiversity needs the documentation and conservation these dedicated naturalists help to provide. Okay, so let's move on to our four presentations that will offer diverse perspectives on other community science initiatives in New York City. To introduce our speakers and to moderate the presentations and the Q&A session, I'll now turn the program over to two of my NYBG colleagues, Tomi Barrett, Ecoflora Project Manager, and Lydia Paradiso, a PhD student at the New York Botanical Garden. I turn it over to the two of you and look forward to the program. Thank you, Larry, for your welcome and introduction to the conference. As Larry mentioned, we will have four presentations. Following all presentations, which will be 20 minutes each, there will be time for questions and answers and discussion. If you have a question, feel free to write it in the chat box, and these will be asked of the speakers during the concluding conference section. Okay, so our first presentation is by Dr. Ann Toomey, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at Pace University in New York City. She's a 
conservation social scientist whose work brings together theoretical insights from human geography and policy studies to explore what happens and who is involved in the spaces between environmental research and practice. Dr. Toomey's work has appeared in environmental science journals such as Conservation Letters, Nature, Ecology and Evolution, Ambio, and Ecology and Society, and has additionally been featured in popular science media such as the science news website, Massive Science, and the Future Tense podcast. We will now turn to her presentation, The Place Making Potential of Participatory Science, Creating Social Ecological Connections in an Urbanized World. Hi all, my name is Anne Toomey and I'm an associate professor at Pace University. And today I'm going to be talking um, about participatory science, kind of my own journey through participatory science, and then give a bit of a case study um, from New York City and urban waterfronts. So first, just to introduce myself, um, I self-identify as an environmental conservation social scientist. Really what that means is that um, I'm more trained as a social scientist, so I use a lot of social science literatures, theories, and methods, but I often publish in more of the biological conservation and ecological science literature uh, literatures and present at those conferences. So my previous research has mainly taken place in um, different parts of like rural Nicaragua and Bolivia, and more recently in New York City. And really what I've been focused on throughout my research in different places is exploring the spaces where environmental scientists, communities, and decision makers can interface. So that often, but not always includes um, participatory science. And I try through my own work, um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, so I bring students into the process and work really closely with different stakeholder groups. So I thought what I talk about today mostly is my own journey through participatory science and some of the questions that have inspired me over the last decade or so. So the first place that I started to really think about participatory science was a, a community called El Arenal in Nicaragua. And this, this was after I spent several years in Mexico working with a nonprofit, um, looking at fair trade and getting buyers for fair trade, like farming products, coffee, et cetera. And one of the things that I felt found really limiting during my time in, in Mexico was I, you know, I felt like this, the impact that we had as an organization was, was really small, really limited to, you know, specific farming groups or just farmers. And I, and I kept thinking more broadly about like what, you know, what systemic change might look like. So that was some of the guiding uh, motivation for the, the work I was doing in Nicaragua, which was mainly just spending a lot of time in this farming village and learning from the people in the village, like what they thought needed to happen to, to make change. And, you know, because I was an outsider, nothing was obvious to me. Like I had to ask questions about everything, right? And I found that through that process of just constantly asking questions and spending time with people that that, that like process of inquiry was, um, was interesting for people, you know? Like one in particular, in one occasion, my research assistant and I, who my research assistant was named, named Donald, and we would, we decided to, to measure all the trees along this like road, um, kind of curious to see uh, if there was more biodiversity of the trees along this road, as opposed to like in this commons area. And we found that as we were started, it was just the two of us. And then within like an hour, we had like four people that were measuring the trees with us. And, you know, there was something about the process of doing scientific research that was getting people curious, right? And engaged in what we were doing and asking questions. And so that that really gave me like the sense that there's something about science or something about the process of science that has real potential, right? So after I came back, um, I am originally from New York and I came back to New York, the New York area and I got hired on this um, project that was looking at biodiversity across an urban rural gradient um, from like the heart of New York City up to upstate. And one of the things I found, we had these citizen scientists coming along with us to do the research 
and started to see that, you know, the way that people were thinking and talking about um, the local environment, like which is like a really, you know, urban area was shifting as they were participating in the program. And so this led me to this question, how can scientific research influence attitudes and behaviors towards the environment and how can it shift potentially policy and social norms? So after that, I I decided to do a PhD actually, and I ended up doing some research in Bolivia. Most of my time was spent in a place called Medini National Park, really an incredible area in terms of biological diversity. It's one of those biologically diverse places on the planet. And also it's really important for cultural diversity in terms of um, different indigenous communities, um, particularly there, the Takana, the Saeha, uh, Mosaten, Chiman, Quechua communities. And so the region I was in working in, I, you know, I went in with this uh, outsider perspective that I developed a research proposal on my own, really, with, with limited, very limited knowledge of the local context. And when I first went there, I, I realized that the research that I had proposed to do was not really locally relevant. And actually, the communities in the region and, and the park staff, they had been pretty much overwhelmed by researchers that had been coming to the area, uh, folks like me. Um, so the, they actually have a word called tesista, which essentially means thesis maker. So they had a lot of tesistas that were coming and doing you know, dissertations, graduate work, master's projects, uh, and, and not returning the findings of their research to the communities. So this really brought up a lot of questions for me in thinking about you know who's included and who or who's excluded in research and science communication. How are people involved or not involved? How can, for example, we engage with perspectives beyond Western scientific worldviews? And then this, this question about whether or not access um, and engagement in scientific processes is actually a justice issue, right? Is science in, in these particular contexts, can it be seen as just another form of colonialism if that research is not brought back or people are not fully um, giving consent that research is being conducted on their lands. So this this really struck me in that, okay, like why are we doing science and who is science for? You know, especially if we're doing environmental research, are we incorporating the people in that process and in, in sharing the products of the research in the way that we should be doing? And just to give you a sense of a snapshot of, of like what the types of perspectives I was coming across, I'm just going to share this 90 second video. I did some film filmmaking when I was out there. Para mí, la investigación es buena, pero si se maneja de una manera correcta, digamos, ¿no? Pero hay, hay personas que hemos visto muchos en, este, en estos últimos años se han llevado cantos, se han llevado historias, se han llevado vestimenta, cómo somos y cómo, cómo, cómo es nuestra cosmovisión. Esa, esa, esa investigación debería estar aquí porque a nosotros nos corresponde esa documentación, porque solamente son recopiladores de nuestra información, de nuestros saberes culturales que nosotros tenemos. Quiere, en, en otros términos, decir, se nos están llevando nuestros aprendizajes al otro lado. Pero sin embargo, no queda escrito nada acá. Por eso hay mucha eh, resistencia de la gente en el campo cuando llegan los investigadores. Porque generalmente eh, hacen una explicación muy rápida y se van sin dejar ningún resultado. Y bueno, saben pues si eso ha traído beneficios a, a la larga. O simplemente es para el investigador que ha hecho ese trabajo para captar fondos para la organización, para su organización o para el propio, ¿no? Entonces... So, you know, I showed that film um, a few times when I was doing my PhD work, and one of the places I showed it to was actually at this uh, geography conference that had this participatory or more fuller geography session where they had um, stakeholders from the, like community groups from London there. And it was interesting to me that there was this guy from this community-based nonprofit in London, 
And he just sat there like nodding his head the whole time. And so it really struck me from that and from other times I've shared these types of experiences that when stakeholders see this, even though, you know, it's very specific to um, like Bolivian indigenous perspectives in this case, that it is a shared experience that people have this perception of research and researchers as not really being in touch, not really engaging with um, people on the ground that are doing the work. So that's that's like really what shaped a lot of how I think about um, participatory science and the way that I think about my own role as a researcher and how I try to, to go about this work. Um, so after I did my PhD work, I came back to New York again, um, got hired at Pace University, and I started looking really at citizen science and, and New York City waterfronts. And so here I was interested in this question, kind of going back to you know the time when I did some work with Earthwatch, in this question about does participation in science help people to connect to and care about the places where they live, um, and what is that? What does that mean? Like, what are the what are the justice and equity questions in there? And so, I think part of it is this, you know, this broader question about environmental justice. So we talk about environmental justice often through the lens of pollution and harms, um, especially air pollution, like where highways are built, uh, and how they those are often built more in poor communities, communities of color. But environmental justice isn't really just about participant protection for environmental harms, right? It's also about access to environmental goods. And if we're talking about this in urban environments, we're talking about parks, we're talking about green spaces, and we're talking about blue spaces, such as waterfronts. So one of the least studied of those um, is waterfronts, right? Waterfronts, um, we're often not thinking about them as these spaces for people to engage and have access to of um, potentially environmental goods because often they're associated with environmental bads. Um, they're places of potential pollution due to like combined sewage overflow. They're also places that are isolated, right? Separated because of highways from, um, from where people are living and, and playing and working. But they're also very important. I mean, I'm, here I'm talking more about um, ecosystem services or benefits to humans. They're important also for biological um, reasons and other species, but you know they provide urban cooling, they provide recreation, social gatherings, relaxation, education, even provision of um, food and medicine. And for many city dwellers, for people who can't necessarily get out and like go upstate or you know go to the the beach off on Long Island. These spaces are the, the only type of kind of quote unquote nature that people can access. So, you know, one of the things that I've been asking in my research um, with different waterfront groups is does participation in participatory science help people connect to urban waterfronts and urban nature in general? And what does that look like? So I'm just gonna quickly talk about this one project that I have been involved in with the Billion Oyster Project. Um, and we were looking really at how participation in, in programs associated with the Billion Oyster Project, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second, can foster this kind of ecological sense of place. The sense of New York City, for example, being a city of islands and not just an urban jungle. So the Billion Oyster Project is an organization um, that was founded in 2008 to put 1 billion live oysters and 100 acres of oyster reefs in New York Harbor by 2030. Um, and, and there's this goal that underlines a lot of what BOP is trying to do, which is to develop a stronger connection between New Yorkers and their harbor. And they do this through a network of oyster research stations and community reefs, reefs around the city and then different volunteer projects where people can participate in terms of monitoring the oysters, um, educating about the oysters, learning about them, etc. And I used an approach that can be called participatory action research. Through this, I it meant that I really worked very closely with BOP staff. So we formed all of our interview questions and methods. Um, the, the main research questions of the research were developed through this research agenda setting workshop with BOP staff. And we decided to focus on participant motivations and experiences as kind of like a guiding way forward in thinking about how the program was working and maybe how it could work differently. 
So we did interviews, um, focus groups, um, surveys, and um, visits to different community reef sites. And, you know, there's some just some qualitative analysis that we did was um, we we looked at the different code frequencies. So basically, what, what did people talk about the most? And we found that people talked about um, networks, they talked about engagement, they talked about communicating, really, they were talking about a lot of things that have to do with connection and communication. Just a snapshot of different organizations that were mentioned by different participants. So seeing this kind of network of connectivity um, and people talked about, you know, the value of learning about new networks. So, for example, one person said with BOP, I'm just always constantly learning. It's making connections, different branches of the New York Harbor, organizations or researchers that I never knew existed. So it's like opening up a whole new world, um, which is really exciting. And then one person similarly wrote about, um, I think the thing that gives me hope is all of the organizations, because when you start to see how many people really care about these things and are super dedicated, and that's their life work, well, then I think, OK, there's someone looking out for us. And people also talked about the absence of connection. So um, one question that we asked was, do you feel like your work with BOP has an impact? And someone said, see, you know, that's what I don't know. And I guess I wish I did know. I would say that I don't understand who or what the Harbor community is. I mean, I know there is one because when we're out there, we see people who work there and have boats, but I don't know who they are. And if there's a community, if so, where? Like, where do they hang out? So I don't know. I hope so. And we found these, these themes coming up again and again, where really people were talking about the importance of you know not just the knowledge that they were producing through engaging in the citizen science so monitoring oysters or learning about oysters but really the social and community aspects of the project and how essential these were in seeing oneself and the project as part of something bigger um, and i found this interesting because um, you know when we talk about connection to nature that's a construct that is often associated with individual experience and not really something always thought about in terms of a social collective experience, which definitely, you know, for my own other experiences in, in Nicaragua and Bolivia, it was really strongly imprinted on me how social and cultural and collective um, these types of experiences were. So I think in terms of urban environments, we can start thinking about how participatory science can start to shift this collective sense of place. You know, if we can find ways to make to make this sense of like an ecological environment, an urban area, be something that is shared across uh, the wider community, it can it can strengthen our own deeper personal sense of connection to different na natural spaces. So, for example, participating in BOP can enhance one sense that New York City is a harbor community and then leading to this more these more social historical cultural ecological associations with the waterfronts thus reinforcing these individual connections so the recommendation that that we had um, for the for BOP was really to strengthen and make more explicit the social and network elements of the project so the message that I hope to leave you all with today is that participatory science can be many things. And I think there are a lot of questions that we can ask um, that speak not just to engagement in science, but really what is science for and who is science for? So often there's a real focus, for example, on engaging people in data collection, which I think is, is really important and great. I think that's a there are some amazing projects that are opening up different ways that people can help out and, and get engaged in actually helping to do the science. But I think just as importantly, we can think about, you know, who's setting the research questions? Um, who is disseminating the research? How is that research being disseminated? And how, how we can engage other people and other stakeholder groups in different stages of the research and science process. And so ultimately, I think, you know, when we're thinking about environmental issues, we're often thinking about how do we transform relationships between people and land, people in different species. So especially in urban areas, like how can we get people to see urban areas as places of nature and worthy of, of caring and stewarding? But 
If we want to transform this relationship, I think I think it's also really important to think about what is the role of science in that process and how can we make engagement in science more integral to transforming this relationship. So thanks very much to my co-authors and collaborators, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Toomey. Um, oh, am I muted? Okay. For the explanation about how particip participatory science can uh, connect people with place and instill the desire for these people to care about the stewardship of these places with the great examples from New York City and uh, beyond. Next, we'll have a talk uh, entitled Elevating Student Voice Through Community Science Initiatives at Biobus, co presented by Christine Marisi and Tessa Hirschfeld Stoller. Dr. Marisi is currently the Director of Community Science at Biobus. She graduated from the University of Vienna in Austria with a PhD degree in genetics. Prior to her position at Biobus, she directed a teaching laboratory and co-developed several community science programs centered around biodiversity in the New York City metropolitan area for the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory's DNA Learning Center. Tessa Hirschfeld Stoller uh, is a senior community scientist at Biobus. She graduated from Wesleyan University with a BA in Neurobiology and Behavior. She then went on to earn an MA and MPhil in Neuroscience from Columbia University, where her research focused on the development of the serotonin system and its role in anxiety and depression disorders. As a scientist at Biobus, she develops and implements inquiry-based STEM programs based on hands-on pedagogy in Biobus's community lab spaces, providing students from all backgrounds with early and rich exposure to meaningful science experiences. We'll now hear from them about some of these community science initiatives at Biobus. Thank you so much for this like um, great introduction. I'm just going to get our like, you know, slide decks ready and um, then we get started. In the meantime, hi everybody. As Lydia said, my name is Tessa Hirschfeld Stoller, um, and I am a senior community scientist at Biobus, and I identify as both um, a neuroscientist, a community scientist, and a science educator. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work we do at Biobus. Christine, if you could go on to the next slide. Yeah, so for those of you who haven't heard of Biobus, we're a nonprofit organization in, here in New York City. Um, we've been around since 2008, and we've really shaped the science outreach scene by bringing science to people of all backgrounds um, and all ages. And our vision at Biobus is that all people um, are given the opportunities to achieve their full scientific potential. And our mission is that Biobus helps K through 12 and college students in New York City discover, explore, and pursue science. And we specifically focus on students that are, have been and continue to be excluded from the scientific community due to factors such as race, gender, and economic status, and physical access. And we focus, our team, uh, Christine and I work on, focus in uh, the Harlem Influence Zone, which is Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, and the South Bronx. And we have another team within Biobus that focuses on the Lower East Side and uh, Chinatown. So I wanna tell you a little bit about how we do these um, uh, programs, Christine. Yeah, so we have a, um, we, uh, uh, our goal is to really create science communities and um, community lab spaces that are for everyone, that nurture science identity long term. And we do this uh, using a, a STEM pipeline model and a, a three pronged approach. So we have our Discover programs, which are our one touch programs where students are usually meeting a scientist for the very first time, um, using research grade science equipment for the very first time. Sometimes that's 
you know, second graders coming into our, our mobile lab um, using a, an electron microscope for the very first time. Um, sometimes that high schoolers getting to do experiments with us on our bio bus for the very first time. Um, and then we have our Explore programs, which are uh, a little bit more in depth. And those are usually five to 10 week programs in which middle schoolers, um, high schoolers or elementary schoolers can come learn about something um, in depth with us and work with our scientists. And uh, the next level of the pipeline is our pursuit programs. And that's for high school and college students who know they kind of have a have the science bug and haven't been exposed to science research. And there they're able to um, work with scientists um, from all over the city and really learn how to do research and implement their own research. And, and those are the programs that I'm going to be telling you about today, because these students are actually executing and um, designing their own community science projects. So I wanted to tell you, a, I've, I've mentioned that we uh, build community lab spaces. So we do that in a couple ways. Um, we have two mobile laboratories that are community labs and those can go to and do go to every part of the city um, from Hunts Point to East New York um, and can go where we're needed the most and usually going to schools that are um, the, the most under-resourced. And then we have a brick and mortar lab as well, and that's called BioBase Harlem. And um, that is housed at the Columbia University Zuckerman Institute, which is a uh, neuroscience institute um, with um, hundreds and hundreds of neuroscientists. And we're in the ground floor of that building, which gives us, gives our students really great connections to a greater science community. Alrighty, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about our junior scientist programs, which are our pursuit programs. And I think what's unique to, to our programs is that we're providing an infrastructure where young people both get to ask community science questions and lead those projects and um, really um, execute community scientists, science um, independently. And in those, uh, in those programs, we have kind of two parts. We have our science research part where they're trained in science research, trained in techniques, philosophy of science, and they're mentored um, by biobus scientists as well as volunteer scientists um, that are coming in from universities all over the city, as well as near peer mentors. And these are usually college students from the same background and the same demographic as our students, as our high school students, um, which is a really important resource for the high schoolers um, and bring things that we, we can't bring to our students. Um, and so that's, they have an entire ecosystem of mentorship. And then the second portion of the internship is community outreach and science communication. And there the students received um, and engage in science communication training um, with experts across the city. Um, and they get opportunities to teach younger students. Um, they they um, teach at public events. And here on the right, you see a picture of one of our um, young high schoolers actually teaching some, some very young scientists um, about some soil organisms on our bio bus. Um, and, and, and this is a really special example because this is um, the student here on the right, Amber, um, has actually been with us since she was in fourth grade. And she has moved through all of our Explorer programs and is now a junior scientist with us where she is leading teaching as well as leading her own research. Um, so, so our goal is really that um, at least 50% of our students are moving through our Discover Explore pathway. And we have many students like Amber that we've been with, basically watched her grow up in um, biobus science. And um, again, our students, 90% of the students in our junior scientist program are um, from groups 
that are excluded and um, underrepresented in the STEM fields. And um, geographically, over 85% of our students are from Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, and the South Bronx. And that means that they either go to school or live in that area. Alrighty, so um, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, about the goals of our program. And, and I think the number one goal is that our students are building science identity and that they're gaining science competence and confidence in science by doing both these independent community science research projects and engaging with the community. So um, another goal is that they gain science communication and teaching skills and general uh, public speaking skills that'll be essential to them as they move on to be scientists, that they're building relationships with younger and older people in their communities, um, and that they're really becoming uh, science ambassadors for their communities. Um, and finally, that our students who um, come from groups that are, are not always uh, given an opportunity to feel belonging in science, um, really leave our programs with a sense of belonging in science. So um, we, um, I oversee three of our internship programs. So we have our Women in STEM program, which is our level one program. And those are for students who have, are kind of tiptoeing into science and um, are really getting, getting hooked for the first time. Um, and that program is specifically for um, women, gender non-conforming and uh, trans students. Um, and our level two program is um, a program that goes a 14 month program. And you, you see a photo of them here um, where students are doing both the science research and the community engagement in science communication. And our college program um, is a program where our college students are mentoring the research project. So they, that really helps them build both competence and confidence because they are, they are leaders in the community science projects, um, as well as doing teaching um, for elementary and middle school students in the area. And our fourth, fourth program is our New York City Virus Hunters program, which Christine is going to tell you about um, in depth in just a few minutes. So um, before we jump into that, I just wanted to give you a sense of a kind of a broad overview of some of the community science programs, um, projects that our students um, are asking and executing. Um, we do a lot of our research on the Hudson River. We have a um, lab space on uh, the Baylander, which is a um, old Navy vessel that's moored at 125th Street um, on the Hudson. So many of you have, have probably seen it in passing. Um, and that, that space is actually a restaurant half of the time and a marine ecology lab half of the time. Um, so our students get an opportunity to um, really think about what issues uh, are affecting the Hudson River and our human interaction with the Hudson. So one of the projects this summer, students were really interested in the effects of human waste um, on the Hudson River. And specifically, the Baylander is just south of um, a wastewater treatment plant. So they were interested in um, the combined sewage output as well as um, looking at uh, bacteria north and south of the plant. Um, we have other students that were really interested in uh, the, the effects of microplastics on diatoms in the Hudson River. Um, so microplastics um, can agglutinate to diatoms, which prevents them from um, properly doing photosynthesis. And so they were, our students were particularly interested in looking at the dissolved oxygen um, levels uh, as, as related to different uh, microplastic levels also around that wastewater treatment plant. And we also have students who are interested in um, freshwater 
and in lakes and ponds and the effect of fertilizer runoff. So they were looking at the, the levels of ammonia and nitrates and how that affected um, locomotion of some freshwater crustaceans. And then I would say our, our other big chunk of community science is neuroscience focus. Um, and we have students who are interested in um, alcohol and caffeine and its effect on humans. And so they modeled that um, looking at behavioral traits in Drosophila using uh, different locomotion and geotaxis assays. And other students who were interested in how uh, high sugar and high fat uh, salt diets affect humans, and they modeled that in Drosophila. And uh, lastly, we have two scientists who are um, two young scientists who are both musicians, and they were looking at a sentiment analysis of the different components of music um, and breaking it down into the lyrical and the instrumental, and actually um, programmed an entire experiment that they um, then sent out to the community. It was pretty, pretty impressive what our young people are doing. Yeah, so I wanna give you a second to, to read these quotes, but um, these quotes I think reflect the uniqueness of our program of creating these safe community lab spaces for students to execute research for the first time and as well as helping to develop and nurture the student's um, science identity. So I'll give you a few moments to read these. Oh, I hope everyone got to finish reading this. Alrighty, so I think I'll finish on this note. Um, this is a photo from our students um, end of the year symposium where they shared their research um, with the Harlem community um, and with people of all ages and uh, had a graduation from our program. So I'd like to pass it on to Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tessa. And, and as mentioned, like, you know, we have like many, many community scientists working together at different spaces. We represent a Harlem team, but we also have a team at the Lower East Side. And at the very end of our talk, we're going to share a link in the chat where you can just find out more about the amazing research that actually community scientists doing with us um, as part of our internship and all across. So um, I am going to present you uh, another um, little bit more in-depth example uh, about a um, very recent community science initiative we have running in the city since 2020, and that's called um, New York City Power Centers. Um, so we are uh, part of a very new initiative that actually was conceived before the pandemic started, um, but it is actually very applicable to an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic right now. It's basically tackling, you know, how can we just generate crucial data on the prevalence of viruses in American cities? Of course, we are a nonprofit organization. We are not working with human viruses, but um, we work with bird or avian viruses. And um, what we do is we all came together and we conduct New York City's first large scale, but also safe surveillance initiative. And we, at the moment, look at two bird viruses. One of them is influenza and the other one is called Avian paramyxovirus, um, if you have never heard of this, that's fine. I have also never heard of them before I joined the project or I received the project. It's also known as Newcastle disease and it's an economically very important poultry virus. Um, we are rooted in the One Health uh, approach, which means we are working at the intersection between animal health, human health and environmental health. And if you just like tackle all three of them, um, we just like, you know, can have like global health being propelled. Um, at the moment, we're having um, a collaboration between three major New York City organizations working together to work on this. We are generously funded by FluLab. Um, Biobus is the main hub and overseeing the collaboration. We are looking for community scientists like high school junior scientists mentioned here on the slide. Um, so we find those students in the local neighborhoods, we recruit them, we train them, and then we actually guide them throughout the whole research process. 
um, lab work is done um, generously by um, Mount Sinai um, supported uh, at the Florian Kramer Lab at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we also have Phil Mead working with us, who is a, a postdoctoral fellow in the Kramer Lab. And then we also collaborate with the Wild Bird Fund, which is a, a wildlife um, rehabilitation clinic at Upper West Side. And what they do is actually treat thousands of wild birds um, that collide with windows uh, found on sidewalks or actually are turned in sick. So um, they actually just give us another chance to train students in veterinary medicine and just open those, um, open other career path. So this is the workflow. Um, every year, um, I get the great opportunity to work with five high school junior scientists to go out and collect samples in New York City parks and other natural areas. Um, of course, um, we work in New York City, so I have a sampling permit um, and I work very closely together with the New York City Parks and Recreation Department. And it's not a very glamorous work because it involves really like, you know, donning proper PPE and then go out and pick up bird poop samples, um, preferably in the early mornings or in the early afternoons. In addition, we also like, you know, collect fresh samples at the Wild Bird Fund and the Animal Care Centers in Manhattan. And then um, all those samples are processed by the junior scientists inside of the Kramer Laboratory. And it is a real community science initiative because number one, those students, they were just really hungry to get involved in research that could potentially prevent the next pandemic, right? Talking about like, you know, looking what kind of viruses are circulating in the urban belt bird population, but also like, you know, doesn't mean like, you know, it's actually dangerous for humans, but you know, it can actually be um, very beneficial to assess what's happening about birds to just keep other wild birds protected. Um, so they are really involved in, in, in every single step. And that's just very important if you just like would like to do community research and community science. Um, some initial results are, so we have been going um, with the high school students uh, many, many times um, to many different parks and collected more than 700 wild bird fecal samples. And it always has been a very interesting um, journey because um, very often students um, are, you know, of course we have proper PPE, so we have masks and gloves on. Um, but a lot of people approach us and ask us what we're doing, right? So it's really a great opportunity to have some conversations like that was actually just mentioned in the previous talk, like, you know, the community is curious, um, they're wondering who is doing that work. And um, at the moment, um, we also like, you know, help the students to train their science communication skills and being actually very proud of like, you know, well, we are actually doing this work to keep the New York City wildlife safe. And I'm actually like, you know, also learn how to be a scientist along the way. Um, more than 1700 samples have been then collected. Um, under supervision from wildlife rehabbers and clinical technicians at the Wild Bird Fund. And so in total, we have a whooping number of 2,400 samples and we keep going. These are also not the latest stats, um, but you know, those slides are usually provided by the students. So um, we just keep going. So all samples, as I mentioned, like, you know, are processed inside of the um, Icon School of Medicine um, Kramer Laboratory. Um, we have, like, you know, specifically been supporting the Wild Bird Fund by screening more than 750 samples for um, avian influenza since February. Um, the majority of us coming from poultry, waterfall, and raptor samples. Um, this is an ongoing process, and we um, specifically made sure, like, the students um, are learning how to tailor their communication around this and really raise awareness about the pandemic preparedness in community, especially specifically about like avian influenza and um, also influenza vaccines available to the to the human population. Um, and the interesting story that actually came out of the project was we we did find eight birds that actually have been tested positive for avian paramyxovirus and Newcastle disease. Um, on RT-PCR, um, we were able to isolate two live viruses. Um, they were fully sequenced and further characterized by a technique called next generation sequencing. Um, there are federal regulations so we actually had to report them to the USDA in June 2021. And then we also find more, um, six more birds that actually um, were carrying that virus, but we couldn't get the live virus. We just characterized them genetically by a diagnostic marker called the F gene. And this is very surprising because we have been the first ones actually finding those birds, um, finding those viruses in circulating in New York City birds. Um, and this is also for me, I like to think about the power of community science. We do research where 
um, nobody else is actually looking or where actually the scientific community might not have the means, time or even interest to study um, these kind of research questions. Um, this is just a, a graph showing you where we actually have been finding those birds or where those birds have been coming from. Um, the live viruses, you know, are coming from birds um, um, found in, in Manhattan and all the other ones are coming from like, you know, Queens and Brooklyn. Again, there's no concerns for humans. Um, Newcastle disease is not an issue in humans at all, uh, but it can have devastating effects to other wildlife birds and especially poultry. Um, this is just showing a phylogenetic tree, again, like a family tree, where you can see like these two genetic sequences in blue here highlighted are our sequences found by the research scientists in the project. And these are the first ones ever found in New York City, and they're very closely related to other viruses that have been found in Maryland and Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So in the Northeast area, regional area, again, those viruses were found in pigeons. Pigeons are not like, you know, um, very migratory, so they're resident, um, but they actually just, you know, mix and mingle with birds that are uh, migratory. So there could be a chance of like, you know, infection, but again, um, we don't have any current outbreaks and it's usually not a concern for humans, so we're not overly concerned about this. Um, if you would like to know more about this, um, we have been publishing with the actually high school students as co-authors because they did just so much in the project uh, in microbiology spectrum um, earlier this year. And um, again, we also find more information about this project on our website at Bibus. Um, ongoing research, um, besides these two live viruses found, um, we actually also characterize all the other ones. And what we see is like, you know, none of those sequences has been identical. So which means there's this first indication um, that we have a lot of like unknown diversity of Newcastle disease viruses like circulating in a local New York City pigeon population. And we are working again with the Kramer Laboratory and with the Weld Bird Fund to investigate this further. Okay, so this is just an overall slide. Um, the project started in 2022 and we had until um, 10 junior scientists like you know, working with us directly together. Um, we are collaboration of three mental institutions. We found that until now eight novel viruses and um, we keep screening samples and we have thousands of samples already in, in one of our like, you know, locations uh, stored for um, further investigation. And what I also wanna mention is like, like Tessa mentioned, um, when you do community science, like communicate, communicating what students found back to their community, to their families, like how are you going to bring science to the kitchen table is very, very important for Bibus specifically. Um, I would like to highlight, like, you know, this project got some media attention because, again, we did start during the pandemic and it was just a very attractive topic for news uh, outlets to um, get the students interviewed. So we had a feature in New York Times. We have a Dysphic Neurology podcast um, feature um, in December 2021. So if you would like to hear from the students directly about their research experience and how they think about like, you know, how it changed their perception to science, please check those resources out. And this is it. Um, again, thank you so much for this general invitation. Um, if you would like to get in touch, um, these are our email addresses, like Christine and Tessa at Bibus.org. And we are a nonprofit organization. And I just want to give a shout out that, like, you know, to our funders that just generously, like, you know, make, make this research possible. This includes the Sloan Foundation, Science Sandbox, which is an initiative of the Science Foundation, the Pinkerton Foundation, the West Harlem Development Corporation. We are also, like, um, supported by local elected officials the Bible Board of Directors, and people like you. And with that, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I can do a time check if there's like, you know, um, actually, yeah, I think we don't have time for questions, but like just get in touch and I would love to hear from you. All right, thank you so much, Christine and Tessa for sharing insights on how K through 12 and college students in New York City and beyond can discover, explore, and pursue science through the BioBus experience. Our next speaker is John Beersey. Uh, he's an electrical engineer by training, BS and MS, and vocation, and is a passionate advocate for the use of native plants in garden design. He also holds an Associate of Applied Science degree in horticulture from Farmingdale State College, and has conducted floristic surveys in Central California and the Cape Floristic <clears throat> region of South Africa. Very importantly for today, 
He, uh, he is a citizen scientist with the New York City EcoFloor Project. Now, John Beersey will present to us a floristic quality assessment methodology, um, methodology for citizen science. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you could be with us today. Uh, I'm speaking with you today not as a horticulturist and not as an engineer, but as a citizen scientist associated with the New York City Ecoflora project since 2018. <clears throat> citizen scientists have been instrumental to the New York City Ecoflora project since its inception. Uh, although the content I'm showing here has been presented at NYBG before, today I would like to tell you the story about my experience as a citizen scientist using iNaturalist for this project in the Alley Creek wetlands. So let's start with the goals of this project. We'll talk about the background of where and how it all started, and then define the FQA as the purpose of this project. Uh, describe the methodology, in other words, the tools and the methods that I developed, and discuss the project results and conclusions that I reached. So I wanted to demonstrate how iNaturalist as an online platform uh, can be used as the vehicle for data collection and analysis for a floristic quality assessment. I wanted to provide a floristic quality assessment of the current health uh, of the plant life within the Alley Creek wetland. And I wanted to develop a free, easy to use assessment tool that a wide audience of natural resource managers could use by leveraging citizen scientists. So I'm- John, I'm gonna step in first. Are you, are you meaning to share your screen now? I have not shared my screen yet. Correct, not yet. Still waiting for that. I'm so sorry. Let me back up. Very good. Thank you for picking that up. So I will continue from where I left off, but just quickly uh, go through the slides that I presented and talked about. So picking up where I left off, I'm also a member of the Alley Pond Environmental Center, which is an organization dedicated to environmental education. It's adjacent to the Alley Creek wetlands in Northeast Queens of New York City. Uh, APEC sponsors the Alley Creek EcoQuest Club that I belong to. And for years, members of this club have walked the trails of the alley, photo documenting the plant life within it. And we often discussed among ourselves the robustness of the native plant life here. My friend, Mike P would say that in the battle here between native and invasive plants, the invasive plants had won. And the battle was over in Alley Creek. You know, when you're confronted with wall upon wall of Phragmites, that's an understandable conclusion to reach. But I wondered how one could know for sure. And I thought back to when I was a horticulture student and we learned in our native plants course about a technique called a floristic quality assessment or FQA for short, that would allow you to measure the health of a native plant community. But I didn't give it much thought because at the time, because an FQA was something that only large governmental agencies 
or universities undertook. And then one day in 2018, a botanist from the New York Botanical Garden came to APEC and gave a presentation about the New York City Ecoflora Project. And he showed us an app for our phones called iNaturalist and how it worked and that we could use it to make observations of plants for the Ecoflora Project. And he encouraged us to spread the word about it, which we did. In fact, the EcoQuest Club then adopted the format of following the monthly NYBG Ecoflora EcoQuest Challenge. So I tried out the app and I went online to find out as much as I could about iNaturalist. I was particularly interested in finding out how the Ecoflora project tapped into all the observational data that was available. And in seeing that a location area for the Ecoflora project had been defined. When I saw that the iNaturalist observational data was available to anyone and that any user could, could use it to define a place boundary, I realized that I might be able to use iNaturalist to help me realize the FQA Valley Creek that I had thought about. So what is an FQA? It's an acronym for the Floristic Quality Assessment. Uh, let's just quickly explore what it is by looking at its purpose, its importance, and its structure. An FQA is a frequently used me method to assess the health of native plant communities by providing an object objective metric and giving a measurable result to guide in conservation and research re restoration methods. The objective metric is called an FQI or an acronym for Floristic Quality Index that is based upon a plant species coefficient of conservatism. Not all native plants are created equal. Uh, COC values are assigned to plants by plant scientists based on a species fidelity to an ecological zone or its ecological tolerance to disturbance within that zone as seen here which you can see that for non-native plants, the COC value of zero is, is assigned. And for native plants, anywhere between a value and one in 10 is, is uh, assigned. So the COC value shown in these photos and used in this project are for the level three ecoregion 59, which is for the Northeast coastal zone. So the FQA was developed decades ago and has been used throughout the United States. The FQI is its measurable index and there have been several equations to calculate FQI. The total FQI, the native FQI, the adjusted FQI, which are essentially just aggregates of the COC values. So given my engineering background, I was able to critique these equations and see their limitations. And I found that the adjusted FQI equation would give the most meaningful results for analysis. So if I was to do a floristic quality assessment of Alley Creek, I needed to develop a methodology of the tools and techniques to use. The first tool is iNaturalist. It's the online platform that I used in this project to not only uh, record observations of plant life, but to create assessment areas and to extract the data for the FQA. iNaturalist allows you to create virtual assessment areas rather than going into the field and creating physical assessment areas. These virtual assessment areas can be any size, any shape and, uh, and, uh, and can be created and viewed on any computer. So these are the Alley Creek assessment areas that I created using the new places feature of iNaturalist. They are all based upon 
ecological communities. So this is the, a map of the Alley Creek composite area as shown in dark green with its ecological community types. This sliver of dark green is the intertidal zone with its mudflats. This is the marsh shown, shown in dark green. And here are some representative plants with their COC values that are found in the marsh zone. And this is the Palestrine lowland zone uh, consisting of a mosaic of ecosystems as shown here. And here are some uh, representative plants in the lowland zone. As you can imagine, there are also many soil tolerant plants in this zone. And lastly, this is the upland woodland zone shown here in dark green. And again, here are some representative plants to be found here. Now, iNaturalist allows you to view the observation data made within an assessment boundary by date or by date range. So each dot in this map of the composite zone represents a research grade observation. As you can see, the number of observations steadily increased over the years, thanks to the dedicated effort of citizen scientists. And I'm not talking about one or a small group of citizen scientists. For this project, um, there were almost 100 citizen scientists making observations and many more doing identifications. So by the end of 2019, there was a good amount of data to be mined for the FQA. I used the iNaturalist export feature to parse the observation data for extraction by date, by plan type, by observation grade, and by the assessment zone. And then I exported it into a standard CSV format file. So uh, the second tool I would need was one that would calculate the FQI metric given the data that I had extracted. At first, I wrote my own primitive FQI calculator tool using an available COC database to calculate the adjusted FQI equation. And I used it to do an initial FQA of Alley Creek. I showed my results to the NYBG ecoflora botanists who encouraged me to continue with the project. I soon realized though, that if I wanted to make this methodology available to the widest possible audience, I could not use proprietary tools and all the tools would need to be online, free to use and off the shelf. So I came across this online universal FQA calculator as the second tool to use. It accepts the CSV format data extracted by iNaturalist and it references it to a companion uh, 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 eco-region specific COC database of plants, which the tool provides. Uh, for Alley Creek, the appropriate database that is available to use, which I mentioned before, is the level three eco-region 59 uh, covering the Northeast coastal zone. Here um, are the results from the FQA calculator for the Alley Creek composite area, showing uh, conservation metrics, 
such as the FQIs and the mean C values, species richness, which shows the mix between native and non-native species, species wetness index, uh, physiognomy, which means the, the habit of each of these plants, whether the plants are annual, biennial, or perennials, and uh, the list of the plants in the sample. So let's look uh, more closely at the FQI, FQI results, uh, the plant distribution results, and the conclusions that I reached from the results and the methodology. Um, FQI uses a uh, species richness uh, ratio and the mean C. The mean C values are an aggregate of the individual COCs we talked about. I use the adjusted FQI uh, equation for its benefits in analyzing results. So these scores for each of the zones, which range between 34 and 38 out of a maximum of 100, indicate a low quality. In addition, the mean C values here indicate a less than minimally stable native plant community. So let's take a deeper dive and see why by going into the results uh, and by examining the COC distributions. So in this chart of COC distribution, uh, a value of zero is indicative of an alien plant, a non-native plant. Uh, values of one to three indicate uh, native plants that are ruderal or pioneer or fast spreading, and they can be invasive in and them themselves. Plants that fall within the range of four to six are indicative of a stable native plant community. Uh, some values in the, by seven as well, but the higher you get and towards a value of 10, you're looking about plants that are highly sensitive to disturbance, or for example, plants that are only found in this one particular region, such as endemic plants or remnant species. This is a reprint of the chart which I showed you before, showing uh, the COC values and their uh, their meanings. So I recommend to restoration managers that the goal of selecting native plants to build native plant communities is to build stable native plant communities. And I believe that they can do this by using the COC values as a guide to selecting native plants for a stable native plant community, which one that's resisted to invasive species. As you can see, not all native plants are going to get you there. So, so here are some takeaways from the project. Uh, first, the FQI metric shows the level of disturbance. The adjusted FQI equation is the preferred one for analysis. And this methodology can be used by restaurant mason managers by leveraging citizen scientists. I'm thinking, for example, about nonprofits with low budgets like land trusts, for example, the Peconic Land Trust on Long Island or the Brewster Conservation Trust on Cape Cod, which could make use of this for assessing their holdings and applying for grants. Uh, so this methodology allows restoration, restoration managers to view um, assessment areas that need, that need management. It allows for GPS pinpointing of invasive species to be removed, and it allows for selecting native plants for restoration. I want to thank the Friends of Valley Pond Park and the New York City Parks Department Stewardship Program for the restoration work that they do. 
and for giving me and the Alley Creek EcoQuest Club opportunities to participate in ecological, ecological restoration projects in Alley Pond Park and the estuary. Lastly, I would like to say to all the citizen scientists attending that I encourage you to carry on contributing your observations and identifications for the benefit of the scientific community. While it's important that you continue to contribute to the one of the many established projects like the Ecoflora project, don't limit yourself to that. Each of you have varied backgrounds and experience which can be leveraged. I urge you not only to do to collect observational data for others in the scientific community to use, but look at the data yourself, see what you can learn from it, interpret it, draw conclusions from it, find uses for it. In other words, when your unique background allows you to see a use for the data, do the science yourself. You can, if you do that, raise citizen science to a new level. Thank you. I'll wrap up my talk this way. Thanks, John, very much for uh, that explanation of the FQA, the floristic quality assessment um, that can be used with iNaturalist uh, data and how that methodology can be easily adapted by other community scientists uh, for completing these assessments. Also, a uh, really great uh, closing statement that I, I wholeheartedly echo. Um, everyone has a unique uh, perspective and skill set that can be used uh, in many different kinds of ways for uh, betterment of the community and understanding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, our final presentation for uh, this morning is uh, by Dr. Kelly O'Donnell, who is the Director of Science Forward at Macaulay Honors College. She holds a PhD in Ecology and Evolution from Stony Brook University and a BS in Biology from Cornell University. Before coming to Macaulay, Dr. O'Donnell completed a teaching postdoc at Columbia University. As Director of the Science Forward program, she oversees scientific programming, including academics and outreach for the interdisciplinary skill-focused curriculum, which includes a massive data collection event in the form of a BioBlitz every year. So now we'll hear from Dr. O'Donnell presenting using BioBlitzes and iNaturalist to build scientific literacy and connections to urban nature. Thank you for that introduction. Let me just get my slides up. Um, I'm so happy to be here um, for the fifth Ecoflora conference. I presented here before and I'm so honored to be back uh, to talk about the participatory and or citizen science projects that we use as a part of ed our educational mission. As we find ourselves in the midst of a, of a biodiversity crisis, it's becoming increasingly important to engage our, stu our students and the public at large in efforts to create stronger connections to the natural world, and also a better understanding of how science works. Um, at Macaulay, we use an annual BioBlitz to build these connections with our students. And we're also the lead organizer for the New York City Arm of the City Nature Challenge, which is a public BioBlitz that aims to foster these connections for the whole city. Uh, to, today, I'd like to share with you uh, what these events are, how they support our goals, um, and how iNaturalist is a key component of these events. Um, and in order to do this, I'll first need to give a little bit of information about the specific educational context we're working in, and then talk about how these events work, because maybe you're sitting there and you want to have some of your own events. And so I think that might be useful. Um, and then I bet there are a few of you who are watching now who have probably been involved in these events. So thank you. Um, and, um, and then I want to end with some, some ways to get involved. So first, the educational context, the Science Forward program was started at Macaulay in 2013 to revitalize our required science uh, component of the honors curriculum. We wanted to make the requirement to be skills focused rather than content focused, um, because we believe that all of our students, regardless of their major, would benefit from honing that set of skills that we call the, the science senses, these skills that basically all scientists employ when they do their work. Um, in order to demonstrate that these skills are useful across the sciences, we have this interdisciplinary course and the students practice these skills in an active classroom. 
Um, the program also includes an open educational resource that you can check out at this URL here. Um, we have about 30 faculty who teach this program across eight of the CUNY campuses that have Macaulay students. And so the OER helps support this sort of distributed network of, of uh, people who are involved in Science Forward. And now because Science Forward is for all of our students, science majors and non-science majors alike, we looked to a type of citizen science event, a bio blitz, to get our students the experience of learning how science works by being engaged in the scientific process. Um, and I'm sure many of you already know this, a bio blitz is a temporarily and spatially limited species diversity survey. For us in Science Forward, it's a required component of the course that happens in the fall. So the bio blitz happens usually end of August, early September. Um, we've, uh, they're about 24 hours long. Um, and we've been to um, uh, nine different parks or green spaces across all five boroughs of New York City since we started in 2013. We've also had two remote bio blitzes during the pandemic where students were making iNaturalist observations from wherever they were. Um, the bio blitz achieves three goals for us. It, it generates a data set that we can have the students use in class. Um, it has students learning about how a scientist works in the field. Um, through their interaction with those scientists on the on the teams of the BioBlitz, and it connects our students from across the eight campuses together because they all uh, get mixed up on these teams together. The BioBlitz takes about eight months for us to plan, and it, so this is a an extremely simplified description of how it all works. Uh, but basically, we start by finding a partner organization that would like to host the event. Sometimes they come to us. Sometimes we go to them. Um, if anyone here is watching and is interested in hosting the Macaulay BioBlitz, let me know. Um, then we recruit the scientists and naturalists who will lead the student teams on three-hour shifts. We call these scientists the taxon leaders. Our BioBlitz is um, taxon specific, so the students uh, can see, you know, the different kinds of methods that scientists use in the field, um, and also to make sure we can like have as diverse a species list come out of this as possible. Um, with the taxon leaders, we, we schedule out the bio blitz because it's a required event and we know we're going to have about at least 420, 450 students at it. Uh, we really need to manage who is there when, um, so that we can make sure the, the teams are manageable. They stay small. So the students have that really great interaction with the scientists. Um, students register for a time slot and then it's time for the bio blitz. Um, our teams at the bio blitz collect data on paper and on iNaturalist. We have found that we do get more species diversity on paper, but the iNaturalist observations are so valuable for the reasons that I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about at the end. So we want to keep that iNaturalist component in there. Um, so we compile all these data, we distribute to the, them to the students and the faculty. And our faculty have to use these data somehow in class. They can make skills focused lessons um, like data visualizations that that just happen during class but what we strongly encourage is that the the faculty use these data to have their students um, create a research project a semester long research project that ends with them presenting a poster at uh, a conference at the end of the semester the Macaulay conference that we call the steam festival uh, I want to focus a little bit on this for a minute here because it's the one of the primary ways we're promoting the teaching of scientific literacy. Uh, we want students to understand science by having them being engaged with the process through research experience. Because, you know, there's evidence that suggests that course-based research experiences improve students' ability to understand how science works. Um, it prepares them to be better evaluators of scientific claims they might see in their daily lives. Um, and there's a few common themes when you ask faculty, well, what is a, an authentic research experience? And so students are designing experiments or they're collecting the data or they're doing the analysis. Um, the students are generating the questions and the hypotheses, um, and then they're communicating the results at the end. And this is exactly what the BioBlitz does for us. Um, students collect these data. They have to come up with a question to ask um, when they're making their poster projects and they have to answer it with the data they collected. Um, they choose the analysis, they choose how to clearly present the results. Um, and so all of these uh, scientific literacy, these data literacy skills um, in particular come into play here. Um, so by the end of the BioBlitz and Science Forward, the students come out of the course with um, the scientific and data literacy practice and a project that they have ownership of um, you know, they did this, they were the scientists. And we're hoping that this also, you know, builds a positive science identity with this, with the students as well. Now the BioBlitz, because again, it's required of our students and has, you know, over 400, 
450 people participating um, can't be sort of a, an open citizen science event for um, the public because we're kind of at max capacity. Uh, but uh, because we believe the BioBlitz is such a powerful experience for promoting scientific literacy, we decided it would be a great idea to join up with the cities that were um, participating in the first nationwide city nature challenge in 2017. And Macaulay has been the lead organizer of the New York City arm of the CNC since then. Um, and we see it as a way of giving back to the city an experience similar to what we can provide for our own students. So it's a, I mean, it is a bio blitz of the whole city. The City Nature Challenge is globally organized by the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of LA County um, and started in 2016 as a competi competition between their two cities, so LA and San Francisco. The first year New York City participated was 2017, which um, was the year it went national. And it's been growing since then to last year we had, or, well, the 2022 City Nature Challenge, we had um, 445 cities participating across 47 countries. And, you know, every year now we have thousands of people recording over a million observations for the past two years on a naturalist over the same weekend. So at the same time in at the end of April. So it's really fun. It's exciting that everyone's doing this together at once. Um, and if you and it's become one of the you know largest global participatory or citizen science events around. So if you look and then if you look across just on the iNaturalist database here, the weekend that includes the City Nature Challenge is the peak week of activity every year. So we're getting a lot of observations into the database during the City Nature Challenge. Um, and the goals of the City Nature Challenge are all about making connections. So we want people who are participating to connect to the nature near them, um, you know, seeing the other species besides just the humans. Um, we want people, but we also want people to connect to, to the other humans. We want them to connect to each other. Um, and to also connect with local stewardship groups who are caring for the environment around them. Um, you know, obviously a goal is to collect a lot of data um, for a lot of biodiversity data that can be used by scientists and land managers and to grow this volunteer base that will hopefully continue to make these observations on the platform. Um, now I wanna go into how this works at the, so the planning level like I did for the BioBlitz, um, the global planning for City Nature Challenge uh, is consists of monthly meetings or discussions. It starts in the fall. New York also starts planning in the fall by gathering, um, you know, new partners and old partners who are going to be holding public events during the days of the City Nature Challenge. Uh, my role here is to get everyone together who wants to host these events um, and support those efforts. So we have meetings. Um, I recruit and train. Macaulay students. So we have this now population of Macaulay students who've had the BioBlitz experience. They know how to use iNaturalist. Um, I recruit some of them, give them extra training, and then I can send them out to these public events to be um, an iNaturalist pro or an iNaturalist ambassador. So the host, the person, the group that's holding the event can focus on showing off their particular park area or green space or wherever it is. And then they have this Macaulay student there who can help the people who are at this event, you know, start making their first observations on iNaturalist and they can help with some of the, the tech side. Um, they, in the weeks before um, the BioBlitz, will have some workshop, I'm sorry, not the BioBlitz, the City Nature Challenge, will have some workshops um, for getting started on iNaturalist again, so people can, you know, hit the ground running, making observations as soon as the days of the City Nature Challenge start. Um, and so then it's time for the City Nature Challenge. It has two phases. So the observation period, which is the four days when all of the um, iNaturalist observations made in the city get counted towards our, our, our totals. Um, these are the four, you know, bio blitz days of, for the city. Um, the target audience for this is everyone. <laughs> so people who live in the city, people who commute to the city, families, schools, clubs, stewardship groups, anybody who's in the city um, can participate and should participate. Um, they, you can participate on your own. You can just use iNaturalist while you're standing in the city and that'll just automatically get counted for our totals. Or you can attend one of these public events that our partner organizations hold and, uh, and observe with others, which is also very fun. Um, the, then the, a week after, so for the week following the last day of observations, there's what we call the identification period where 
the iNaturalist community comes in and helps to add ideas to these many thousands of observations that have come in over the, that weekend. Um, and that helps to get the species number up because you get these, um, you get a lot of unknowns that you know need to be sorted, but then you also get a lot of um, identifications and agreements and um, that gets your species list up. Uh, in the early years of the City Nature Challenge, there was more of a focus on having a winning city um, and winning meant the, having the most observations or the most species or the most people involved. Um, but during the pandemic, we've switched to a more collaborative model um, where everyone's sort of working towards a global total of observations. Um, and likely this will stay collaborative because now that we have, you know, 445 cities or more participating, these cities are very wildly like they are different sizes, they have different populations, they are in different hemispheres. Um, so sometimes it's it's hard it's hard to compare them. So so I think we're going to keep this collaborative model going, um, and it's still a very friendly, um, you know, effort. Everybody's getting together to do this global total. Um, some of the cities do operate what's called what we call a hybrid challenge, where they can have some smaller friendly competitions like regional competitions, and we do two. Uh, sub competitions that are sort of internal to the city uh, for, for New York City. We do a Battle of the Boroughs, which is a friendly competition to see which of the New York City boroughs can make the most observations um, or find the most species or have the most people participate. Each borough has a captain that um, helps to get people out in their borough, lets people know what's going on, maybe has a meetup. Um, then last year, Madison Square Park Conservancy organized a green space race which was a collaborative challenge to see how fast the participating parks um, and green spaces could get to 5,000 observations together. It was very fast. I think it was, it was the, within the first two days of the challenge. Um, both of these are happening during the days of the City Nature Challenge. So even if you know someone th is just participating, you're like, I want to support my borough or I want to support my park, all of those observations, because they are happening within the boundary of New York City, still count for our like whole city totals that go into like the global challenge numbers. Um, as an example of some of the results that we've had, these are the 2022 results. We had our highest species number um, for a city nature for a New York City City Nature Challenge. We had our highest observer number. Uh, we added 240 new New York City observers to iNaturalist. So you got these new people out there making connections to nature in the city, and that's great. Um, we're growing the iNaturalist database for New York City with over 5,000 new, I'm sorry, over 7,000 new research grade observations um, and 12 new to iNaturalist species for the New York City records. And then even though it's not a global competition, we can make some interesting comparisons. New York City is ranked first for observations for the 42 similarly sized geographic areas. And one of our top observers, Sarah Rawl, um, was globally ranked seventh for the entire City Nature Challenge. So that's pretty awesome. And now for the rest of the time, I wanna take some time to talk about sort of the importance of iNaturalist to, um, to these events. So it's a, it, it, uh, the importance of iNaturalist to achieving the goals of both of these, the BioBlitz and the City Nature Challenge. Since this is the Ecoflora Conference, I've been assuming that most people know about iNaturalist here, um, just to highlight uh, how a lot of the fostering of the, the connections to nature and, and connections between people who know about nature is built right there into iNaturalist itself. Um, it's a uh, nature lovers and nature curious person social network, um, but it's also a useful tool for citizen science. Um, sorry about that. Oh no. What happened to my slideshow? Okay, sorry about that. Um, it's also, iNaturalist is also essential to the functioning of both the City Nature Challenge and the BioBlitz. So I wanna use some specific examples from a case study that um, the Macaulay BioBlitz was a part of to demonstrate this. iNaturalist is a flexible tool. Uh, it allows students to connect to nature when, they're, uh, when used in their courses while simultaneously allowing them to contribute to this global database. Um, and connect to a global community. So uh, we used examples of the Macaulay BioBlitz um, and examples of courses that use iNaturalist from Brandeis University in Massachusetts and Lincoln University in New Zealand. 
and we examined student-generated iNaturalist data together from several course-based projects uh, and each of uh, in each of the cases to demonstrate how iNaturalist cultivates student bioliteracy, engages them in, in biodiscovery, introduces students to ecological monitoring, and allows them to practice these data literacy skills. So in our cases, undergraduates can build their bioliteracy by making valuable con contributions to the biodiversity knowledge on iNaturalist um, and interacting with the knowledgeable experts there. Um, it, here, we're representing our students' um, iNaturalist contributions um, with these icons that are scaled to their observation counts. Um, this very large fly in the background here is one particularly prolific Brandeis student. Um, and so as of March 2021, when we did this analysis, um, 2,600 students in our course projects made over 66,000 observations of over 5,000 taxa. And many of the students continue to use iNaturalist beyond the um, experience in our courses. So we're hoping that, you know, even if it's not all of them, you know, a lot of them are, we hope that a lot of them are staying on and become lifelong observers on iNaturalist. Uh, by having our iNaturalist course projects focused on observations of one particular location at one particular time, or at a time, our projects are documenting species occurrences in these areas that otherwise um, my, were not made on iNaturalist, so they have been engaged in biodiscovery. Um, one example of this is from our 2015 BioBlitz, which was at Fresh Kills Park, um, and that data set includes 36 research-grade observations of species that are still not otherwise observed there be beyond the BioBlitz data, um, among 60 taxa that are observed fewer than 10 times in the area. So this also demonstrates how useful iNaturalist can be to help creating a baseline species list for less explored areas um, or areas that are newly converted into um, or being converted into public green space. Um, iNaturalist is useful in data literacy training, which I've already talked a little bit about um, because it's open, the data and, and authentic. Like th these are these are data that are collected. Um, you know, they might be a little messy. They they're they're real data for the students to work with. Um, and allows them to think across across scales as well. Um, you know, at the at the base level, you know, students are collecting the data, they're making the observations. Um, then they can use iNaturalist's built-in tools to visualize and summarize the results, um, or they can download data from iNat and then practice some data management skills. They can practice analysis, visualization um, using other programs. Um, I don't think I have time to get into this now, but you, they can if you use a traditional project, which is different from the collection projects I've been talking about. You can also add observation fields and have students engage in some um, ecological monitoring so they can you can have a field for like time out observing, for example. Um, the overwhelming response from our students has been positive. I do not have time to read all of these things, but some of the uh, the quotes we have here is iNaturalist is great for mental health because it gets them outdoors. The students are mentioning the benefits of community, noting that it's nice to see the class working together, making these observations together. Um, and even the ones who start out a little hesitant, like this, this post here about too many ants, they end up having a really great time. So, um, so we think, you know, it's a useful experience educationally. Students are also having a positive experience while they do it. Um, finding the right way to integrate iNaturalist into our work grew out of our own engagement on the platform. So first thing, um, if you're not already on there, get on there now and start using it. Um, and in particular, if you're looking to eventually create your own projects, I'd advise you to explore iNaturalist via the web browser version because the phone app is great for making observations, um, but there's a lot more you can do when you're logged into like the desktop version of iNaturalist. Um, and then you can join projects, like you can join a monthly EcoQuest from the EcoFlora project, or you can participate in the City Nature Challenge. Um, that link there will take you to the project page for the 2023 City Nature Challenge, where we'll start to post um, planning information. And once we have events, we'll post them there too. Um, and once you're familiar with the platform, you can, you're ready to build your own projects and host your own iNaturalist meetups. You can start a small project that's like just for your family or your office. Maybe you can have a competition um, to see who can find the most birds in April or, or a scavenger hunt to see um, if you, who can find the, all of the top 25 species observed in New York City. Um, we do that at Macaulay in the summer. Um, so together we have this opportunity to engage with 
the iNaturalist community to increase our own bioliteracy and participate in biodiscovery and to help others do the same. And we have the opportunity to explore um, the, the nature around us and to inspire the next generation of bioliterate, biocurious, and data literate citizens of the world. And we can do that using uh, citizen science events that use iNaturalist. Um, so I just want to thank the many, many people who participated in the BioBlitz, in particular, uh, Dr. Lisa Brundage and Jenna Fu, who run the BioBlitz with me, um, all the people who participated in the City Nature Challenge. And if you have any questions or want to join or reach out to me, here is my contact information. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks very much, Kelly, for sharing your in-depth experience about using BioBlitz and iNaturalist to enhance scientific literacy um, and connections to urban nature. Uh, we mentioned it before, but I want to add that Kelly is an alumnus speaker from our first annual uh, Ecoflora conference back in 2018. So we very much appreciate her encore performance at this fifth annual Ecoflora conference. Um, we now have some time for questions from conference participants. So please add your questions or comments to the chat if you have not already. Um, I'm going to start with a question that was uh, asked by Chris um, and answered by Christine, but I just wanted to read it out loud here. Um, so Chris asked uh, from the sampling, is there any way to know in which bird species the virus are, are prevalent. Um, for example, Newkirk Plaza is in my neighborhood, mostly pigeons and house sparrows. And Christine, you answered, if you wanna go ahead and just reiterate your, your answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, that answer can actually just go both ways. I think um, my initial answer was like, well, I mean, if you find a bird fecal or hashtag bird poop sample, sometimes, you know, I, I personally could not distinguish like, you know, a, a pigeon, fecal sample from a sparrow sample. They're very small, they're very tiny, you know, sometimes more watery than like, you know, um, like uh, have a different consistency. And the only sample that I always like know what it is, is actually a Canada goose sample, which is just massive. And you have to get a very large tube to just like shove it in, right? Um, the, the trick is like, you know, so I can make that distinction, but then there is um, something which is called like, you know, DNA barcoding. You can use certain genetic, genetic sections of um, a species, like, you know, um, genetic makeup, and then use this to identify a bird or any living thing in the world, right? So we can always do this after the fact. Um, Chris, if you're wondering about like, you know, if I know which birds yeah, they might be more susceptible to avian diseases, again, this is... This is ongoing research. There's a lot of pigeons that carry, like, you know, this Newcastle disease virus or even paramyxovirus causing Newcastle disease in pigeons. It's even like a, a certain subsection says, like, you know, pigeon paramyxovirus, um, which again is harmless for a lot of wildlife species and harmless for humans. Um, but um, yeah, so that's the, the only prevalence in knowing the city. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> Great. Okay. So the next question that we have um, is for Anne. There's a, a really great kind of discussion that went on in the, the Q&A section about this, but I think the, the main question here is about uh, situations, they, they talked about uh, beaches closed, closed in the Rockaways where there's uh, protecting, you know, threatened and endangered shorebirds and plants, but how then that can sometimes uh, cause issues in the community. So uh, how would, would, is the best way to find balance in these situations to help the communities embrace the wildlife using these beaches, but also be able to give them access to the waterfront and whether uh, participatory science might help with that? Yeah, so sorry, I wasn't able to, I'm, I'm here with my, my, uh, my class today of seniors and we're gonna be talking about research. Actually, we're doing some wetland research and also research on um, people's perceptions of the waterfronts in New York. So wanted to bring them all in today. Um, so I wasn't able to observe exactly what the discussion was in the chat, but um, I think, you know, one, one thing that's really interesting is looking just at how people are currently using a space and at just getting a baseline of, of the cultural and social uses of particular waterfronts before like trying to then, because then that could actually show, um, you know, what, what is actually happening in a particular area before then trying to perhaps have like some kind of intervention. Like if we don't, there's been a lot of, uh, I think emphasis on doing like a ecological baseline assessments 
of particular particular areas, but especially in city areas, uh, we also just need we need baseline information about just how people are using spaces, how they value those spaces, to just be able to understand like what the trade offs and what are the what are the conflicts that might arise, right? So I haven't been working in that particular area, but another area that I've been working in, Pony Island Creek, you know, there was there was a lot of um, energy from the city in bringing a ferry to specifically to Pony Island Creek, but there was a lack of understanding in that particular area of how the, the community was valuing that particular water body, even though it was polluted, even though, you know, there was a major CSO problem with sewage going into the water. People, that was the backyard for, for people to use that space. So I think just having to using maybe participatory science and some of the methods that um, that can be used to do that assessment are very simple. Like, you know, just observation of use, doing very quick interviews. And actually uh, last last year, I had a, a class of students that we did some, some of this work um, in Sherman Creek in the Harlem River. So, you know, I think there are definitely, one of, one of the things we're thinking about is developing a, a community science toolkit for social observations. So I think possibly this could be something like that could be like, you know, then implemented by neighborhood groups. Like what, you know, how are people using these spaces? I don't know if that fully answers the question. I'm sorry I wasn't able to follow the uh, Q&A discussion. No, but I think that's that would be a really great resource uh, for people to have kind of a starting point to be able to do those kind of analyses. And uh, in the, the, the discussion that people also talked about a couple of things about um, uh, like social, social justice issues, but also the fact that different parcels of land are administered by different uh, entities, whether it's the city, the state, uh, national parks, that that also throws in an extra layer of complexity to all of those kind of things. Awesome. So our next question is for John from Patty. Um, they say, Mr. Verzi, this is very exciting. I wonder how updated FQI can be done with INAT data after removal of invasives. How do you document removal on iNaturalist? So um, on, I do not believe, uh, iNaturalist has several filters to be, able to, to be able to filter data that you want to extract. But I do not believe that invasive plants uh, versus native is one of those filters. I don't, I don't think iNaturalist has any knowledge of what's invasive and what's non-invasive. You'd have to link it to a COC database to be able to, to do that. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't think that can be done. I believe you would have to go back in and there and do another FQA. But the FQA methodology that I'm presenting is very easy to use. It's one of its features is that you can do it repetitively. And so to do what you're suggesting is, I would say you would need to go in and make another FQA analysis. Great. And now we have a question for Kelly. Uh, Adrian asks, uh, I'm considering organizing a bio blitz in, in my area in Northern New York and would like to know uh, what is involved or if there's any advice or suggestions and uh, whether knowing what you know now and the work involved, would you do it again? Well, answer the last part first, absolutely. Doing the bio blitz is one of like my favorite parts of what I do. Um, it is, you know, the way ours is set up, it is particularly challenging to plan. There's a lot of moving parts because it's a lot of people, um, but you can do a bio blitz at many different scales. So depending on, you know, who you're working with and if you're, you know, if you're affiliated with like, an ecology department, you might have tons of people who could lead teams. Um, if you're in like a local, local stewardship group who's got a lot of knowledgeable people about the local flora and fauna, then you also have people um, to lead teams. And you could kind of set it up the same way where you have, you know, taxon focused groups going out at, at particular times. You could also have it where, you know, everyone just decides to meet up all at once. You do a little iNaturalist overview and then you go out and make observations for a few hours and come back and do like a mini blitz of whatever area you're at. You could, I mean, and, and also the spatial scale can be really, you know, different. You could have, you know, a quick blitz of, of someplace very tiny, or you can, you know, spend a day in a larger area. Um, it really depends on where you are and what, and who you, who will be participating. 
Um, that's sort of the first, the first thing to think about, I think. Um, and then deciding like, you know, if you're going to have these teams, do these teams need equipment? Can you borrow it? Um, that's another important consideration. And if it is going to be public, another really important one is thinking about how you communicate that to people so you get people to show up for because again like the Macaulay bio blitz because it's a requirement of our students we know they're going to be there <laughs> um, but if it's a more public bio blitz you want you know you want people to know about it and so you know communicating through iNaturalist is one way looking for the power users in your area if you look up your area in a search on iNaturalist it'll give you a list of who's made the most observations and so you can send them messages to see if they want to help or if they want to come um, and, you know, getting the word out on social media, just so you know, you have people that are going to show up and, and, and help you make these observations. So those would be, I think, the first things I would, I would think about Does that answer all of the parts of that question. Oh. And I think it would be great. Um, I know we have some links that have been put uh, into the chat already, but if the, um, the panelists would put in your, your contact information, um, if there's anybody that, um, wants to ask anything further about any of these things, uh, That'd be great if you could do that. Um, also, just a quick shout out uh, to the Alley Creek EcoQuest Club. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess to so to close it off, I we were thinking about a good question for everybody, um, and I think we've all you've all talked a lot about kind of. Um, the impact of the work and maybe some some challenges associated with it and what the the thing is for the future and uh john had some really good advice for people looking to get um more involved in some of these community science initiatives but i wonder if anyone else has uh any other kind of um advice or um comments for for uh, the audience of people who are either already involved in some kind of initiatives or are you know thinking about doing that I mean, I, I can comment on, on one of the aspects. I mean, those initiatives are not easy to do. I, I think like, you know, there's, there's always this balance between like, you know, we, there's a scientist who wants to get the science right. And there's a community member like who just cares about like, you know, different values, like, you know, all data needs to come into a spreadsheet, not just like, you know, would like to go out there and make a connection to, to nature or just maybe not, or maybe they might be even more scientific, like scientifically trained than the scientists on the project, right? So there's a lot of like things you have to pack on the one hat. But I think the number one thing that I would recommend if you want to start and get involved is just like really take the time to survey the community about their research question. What is it what you would like to answer, right? Having people on your project from the get-go is just so incredibly important. There is no, I come to you and we just gonna like work on a research project together if I'm gonna impose my values and my research question on you. I think those times are really over. So we just like really need to make sure research is done on eye level, um, keep it like equitable for everybody involved. And this also includes, and again, I'm it's very challenging. Like, you know, who do we gonna give credit for? Like, you know, is this data published open access? Um, where do we find this information? Like, you know, are there some legal implications that we cannot like, actually name people? Do people even wanna be named? So again, it to me is like just working with high school students are just like, you know, have these wonderful ideas and and sometimes just don't even have the means or opportunities to actually answer the research question, but we at Biobus really provide strongly. And again, you can also do this on our naturalist, like you know, in an online community or in-person community. It's that's for me the number one key thing. I would just recommend everybody just go out, listen, and then you know, really act on it. Um, I could jump in there as well. I I really echo what Christine is saying. And also I think. For researchers who are interested in, in this, um, I think one, one way to get involved is actually to, to partner with nonprofits that are doing like environmental work because it may be that, you know, to, to really work with a community-based group or within a particular like neighborhood, that that is extremely time consuming. And also um, you, you know, as a as a researcher, you might you, you have to think about things on the long term. Um, like, what does that long-term engagement with that group look like? Whereas like a nonprofit, you know, they might have the funding to stay in a relationship and to continue doing research or work in a particular area for over like, you know, five, 10 years. 
So if you can work and support that, the, the efforts of that particular nonprofit organization, um, that's another way to, to ensure that, you know, you're not coming in and leaving before the work is completed, right? Um, just to, to make sure that it's sustained over time. And if you, you know, if you have to move somewhere else or that, that, that work continues. And that I guess brings back around from the uh, what you had talked about in the beginning of your presentation of that kind of doing that um, in South America uh, or in, in, in Central America, but that also rings true wherever uh, you're doing a project. Even if you also live there, there's still that like coming in and then leaving uh, as opposed to kind of having this longer term effect on the impact on the community. Yeah, exactly. All right. So it looks like it's getting close to our time. Uh, oh, there we have one more question here um, about, okay. So, so Jeanette is talking about um, outdoor learning that there are a lot of kids in New York City that don't have enough opportunities to engage with nature between how much time they're in school um, and if there are any suggestions for how to connect them with nature, I guess, either as, as a, a teacher or as a parent. Well, I mean, I can jump in here and say that they can get on iNaturalist. <laughs> um, and if they're too young for iNaturalist, there is Seek, which is the, you know, the one that's not connected, that doesn't share automatically your location information, in which um, kids might have a better time uh, participating, in, participating in. There are some tools out there to for integrating um, iNaturalist activities into um, different uh, grade bands, including the younger grades. I know the City Nature Challenge has an educational toolkit. Um, so if you're a teacher out there and you're thinking about different ways to bring this to into school so that you have students prepared to be connecting to nature once they are outside, um, there's tools like that that, that you can use um, to help get the connections. And I'd just like to jump in there too and just say that you don't always have to drive a long distance to go find nature. There's lots of nature all over the place. Sometimes you just have to look a little bit closer, um, maybe scale down what you consider nature to be a little bit smaller, um, but it's all over New York City. So. And uh, we are also planning as uh, part of our, uh, as part of Ecoflora by uh, the spring to put together some kind of school toolkit uh, for that kind of thing to integrate uh, iNaturalist, but also more general concepts about urban biodiversity and um, kind of like experiential learning into that too. So that will be, stay tuned for that. All right, so it is 12 o'clock. So um, we're gonna close it out. Uh, on behalf of the New York City Ecoflora team, I wanna really deeply thank everybody, uh, our speakers and our audience participants um, for all of their contributions to the conference today and to the project as a whole over the past uh, few years. So we have a lot of links that were in the chat for more information on Ecoflora uh, and how you can contribute to documenting and conserving plants, fungi, and their ecological partners in New York City. Uh, so goodbye for now, and we hope to see you all soon. Uh, next year at our sixth annual New York City Ecoflora Conference. And in the meantime, at some of our other virtual events, uh, in-person events, uh, et cetera. So everyone stay well, have a good one. Thank you, everybody.